um, that was just held in, in November in Zurich. And this is the fourth one that they've held. And it is a consensus statement. It is not a guideline. Uh, it is a, a group of professionals that have looked at evidence-based information and tried to give us some information that we can make clinical decisions on. Um, there has been discussion in the, certainly in the American press amongst the sport medicine physicians that this is going to lead to uh, legal ramifications and medical legal issues. Um, really it isn't. It, it, these are a, a consensus giving an opinion based on evidence and as you probably know there is not a uh, lot of evidence-based information on concussion uh, just for moral and ethical reasons. We can't subject uh, people to um, randomly controlled blinded studies to see whether uh, treating them one way or the other is good for their brain. So that, that, that's the obstacles we face. So this is based on the consensus and this was world um, representation from all areas of sport uh, from the US, uh, from Canada. There's seven of my um, compatriots from Canada that sat on this, one being the chairman and um, I'd be remiss in thanking uh, one of them who provided the slides for this, um, and that's Laura Purcell, who's a pediatrician in, in Hamilton, Ontario. So I, I do thank her. Again? Sorry. <laughs> that's okay. So th this consensus group, is, uh, as I said, has met four times. The initial time was in Vienna in 2001 where they agreed upon a definition for concussion and they used grading scales. In 2004 they met in Prague and this is where we really abandoned the grading scales. Um, some of the other groups that have made recommendations such as the American Neurologic or the CDC may uh, have mentioned the, the grading scales. Again this is a sport group, those are not sport groups. So that, that's really where the variation is. Okay? The return to play um, decision makings were uh, based on um, concussion symptoms, previous injury, the severity, and most of these things were done in hindsight. Uh, management uh, was based on this and, and this is where they introduced the uh, graduated return to uh, play um, aspect. Okay? Uh, that in 2004 this is when they really started looking at uh, neuropsychological testing and how that might influence or assist uh, assessment and return to play. Okay. In Zurich, uh, and I think everybody's probably familiar with the SCAT-2 and the pocket SCAT-2, which uh, has been utilized on the sidelines. Um, they, at that point, uh, abandoned the simple versus complex terminology that they had uh, recommended in uh, 2004. Uh, there was the uh, balance assessment scoring system, the BESS, uh, that was uh, introduced and, and used as a measuring tool, uh, certainly using baseline for the athlete and then after injury and as a, a, an assisting tool to return to activity. Um, they looked at modifiers influencing the investigation and management of them. They looked at elite versus non-elite uh, athletes and my own personal perspective is they're all the same. Uh, yes, somebody may be uh, paid a little more money to return to activity as a professional hockey player or a professional football player, but we are all interested in the long-term outcome. And that means <laughs> uh, per, uh, chronic brain injury and the like. Okay. In 2008, they mentioned about the pediatric management strategy. So that's really where we were when we got up to um, Zurich this year. Okay. Concussion, non-sports related. 1.74 million traumatic brain injuries in a year. The nice thing is the vast majority of these are mild. So these are non-sport related, okay? Most common cause, um, motor vehicle accident, falls, some are occupationally related, some are recreationally related, and some are unfortunately as a result of assault, okay? When we look at sports related concussion, and this is really where we get the data, and this is why it's so very important to have people that are attuned to sport and athletes to look at the information and make recommendations. Not that the other groups are not capable and well uh, respected, but we, are, we deal with athletes all the time. Okay? So three, almost four million people in the US have a sport-related concussion. Okay? 
10% of, of college players and 20% of high school players sustain brain injuries. So that's one out of 10 in college and one out of five in high school. Okay. What's the impact on the healthcare? They estimate $56 billion. Okay. Um, there's the breakdown on um, what sports are involved. Uh, and you'll see certainly the impact from uh, football, soccer, uh, lacrosse is not popular down here. It is actually the Canadian national sport for those that don't know that, uh, not hockey. <laughs> um, and then we go down the line. So, why is this important? Well, in, in 2011, uh, the legislature passed the Louisiana Concussion Act, which mandates that coaches are required to complete training. Um, they need to have a basic knowledge. They don't need to be experts. Okay? There need to be people that are capable of assessing people whether they should be, they're capable of returning to play. Okay? We, the act also includes that somebody makes an appropriate diagnosis, whether it's a concussion or not a concussion uh, or whatever. Okay? And this is within their um, parameters of practice. Ideal situation is to have a physician skilled and knowledgeable in sport uh, concussion on the sideline of every game in the uh, parish or the surrounding parishes. That's not reality. Okay. The act also says if the athlete is deemed to have a concussion and is removed from play, the coach cannot have them return until they've been evaluated by an appropriate health care provider and received written clearance in some fashion. That takes the onus off the coach and puts it on to the appropriate health care provider. Okay. The graduated return to play can be managed by uh, an athletic trainer, an appropriate individual that can um, manage this program. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So let's go back to a definition. This sounds like a lot of, lot of terminology, but this came out in 2002, really in the, in the first uh, um, Vienna uh, consensus statement, and it, it is a complex pathophysiologic uh, process. It's not just a knock on the head. When they looked at it, it is, it is at a cellular level. Very few head injuries are traumatic where you've had intracranial bleeding. Very few of them. So therefore, the vast majority are really a complex uh, neurocellular uh, aspect. And it is not just, you got a knock on the head, Johnny. A concussion can cause, be caused either by a direct blow or even just from a, a shearing motion, avoiding a blow. Okay? An impulsive force, uh, a hit in the chest that snaps the head back can cause a concussion. Okay? The nice thing about concussion is that it it's usually has a rapid onset and it use, is short-lived. Impairment is usually not permanent. And the key is short-lived and usually not uh, with any uh, major impairment lifelong, okay? And as I mentioned a little earlier, it's a neuropathological thing at a, at a cellular level, more than we need to discuss here, but just to be aware that it is very complex, okay? Concussion does have a set of symptoms, and we'll review that a little bit, but I think most people are, are aware of, of the physical signs somewhat and the complaints of a concussion ranging anywhere from a headache, which is the most common symptom, to uh, nausea, vomiting, to dizziness, or just that sort of um, spaced out feeling. Okay? The thing that we need to do is to really look at um, the ones that are at significant risk of, of problems, major problems, and assess them appropriately and return them to activity appropriately. Fortunately, only in a small percentage of cases do these symptoms are prolonged. Okay? Um, not everybody with a concussion needs a CT. You go to the ER and you say you've had a concussion, you get a CT. That's a medical legal issue that I will never resolve in America. Okay? Um, if you look at the grading systems, you look at the Glasgow Coma Scales, that's really what you base it on. Okay? Okay. So again, in 2008, they abandoned the simple versus complex, okay? They retained the concept that the majority, 80 to 90% of these concussions revo resolve in a very short period of time, seven to 10 days. And they also recognized that kids are different. They're not little adults. 
Same thing with adolescents. So we have to look at them with a, with a different microscope. Okay? So one of the confusing things is, while we hear the term traumatic brain injury, uh, concussion, where does it fall? Traumatic brain injury is a spectrum. Uh, concussion is, is really what we're looking at in that spectrum. And uh, the nice thing is that, as I said, the majority of these are minimal and some into the mild brain injury, and you'll note the Glasgow Coma Scale. Okay? So, um, obviously, normal is 15, mild is 13 to 15, and, and hopefully you'll never see on the field uh, somebody that's at 8. As I mentioned, the clinical symptoms, I think people are very well aware of them. Headache, nausea, vomiting, balance problems, visual problems, fatigue, sensitivity to light and noise, that dazed look, stunned look. Um, sometimes with adolescents, that may be normal for them, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, the cognitive thing, and that's really what they've started to focus on, especially with the recognition that neuropsych testing may be an aid. Um, the ability to concentrate, um, focus, recollection, uh, retrograde amnesia is a factor. Um, one of the important things is that loss of consciousness, unless it's greater than one minute, is truly not a complex issue. So even if Johnny's been out for five to ten seconds, that does not put him at any greater risk. If Johnny's out for two minutes, certainly yes, you're looking at a more significant trauma to the brain. Emotional, and again, in the adolescent, what is normal, what isn't. Okay. We've also looked at sleep patterns. Um, and some are more, uh, uh, want to sleep more, and some are, are hyper. So there's all sorts of different things that we look at from uh, clinical features. Okay. Again, just a reiteration of the same things. The mood and cognitive disturbance we're recognizing is perhaps a, a little more important tool. Okay. What are some of the signs? very similar to what I've just described. Okay. Okay. So what are the assessment tools? As I mentioned, the SCAT-2 came out in 2008, and I think that was an excellent tool. We've all used the sideline assessment of concussion, and this is really just a, another tool. Okay. So that's a SCAT-2. So what's come out now? Um, as a result, they've come out with a SCAT-3. This is really a, a refine, uh, refinement of the earlier tool, and here's how it's a little different. Okay. They also came out uh, with a child SCAT-3. And the uh, SCAT-3 is really for people 13 and older. The child SCAT is under. So this is really an important tool that we have to utilize. Okay? So that one goes by the wayside. Okay? And let's look at this. Okay? These are available online. and. Um, the nice thing of this consensus group is they publish in the British Journal of Sport Medicine and the Clinical Journal of Sport Medicine simultaneously in March. They have a link. You can download all this information. They encourage it. There's no charge. Okay? So they want to disseminate the information to people like you who can utilize it and uh, help assess our student athletes and get them appropriate management. Okay? So, Again, I'm not going to spend time, people can read, but basically we recognize it and remove the athlete from participation. We look for the uh, visible clues, we look for the signs and symptoms, we look at memory function. You know, asking what day and what week we learned is not a good tool, but really asking what quarter are we in, uh, what was the score, uh, what was the last play called is a more appropriate assessment of somebody. Okay? There are red flags. Okay? And those are the things you need to be aware of. Okay. The athlete complains of neck pain. Remember, every neck pain potentially has a concussion, and every concussion potentially has a neck injury. So you have to um, assess that appropriately. Okay. Worsening confusion is a red flag. Repeated vomiting. Some people will vomit uh, just spontaneously, but it's the repeated uh, aspect of it. Okay. Um, a seizure. Uh, is not totally abnormal with a, a significant head trauma, but it is one of the warning signs you should uh, get further assessment. Okay? Weakness or tingling, focal neurologic signs is important. Uh, change in their mental status, um, progressive headache, uh, unusual uh, behavior change, and double vision. Again, these are red flags. That means they need further assessment. Okay? So the SCAT-3 is a sideline assessment. Okay? And um, 
We have a scoring system which we gather on everybody, and these are, are just going through the process. Okay? The next thing are the instructions, because if you don't, you don't read the manual, you don't know how to use the, the um, tools. And the last component of it is really um, demographic data. Okay? The SCAT 3 um, is for 13 years and older. And again, some modifications on it from the SCAT 2. The sideline assessment is a little different. Indications for emergency management. You'll note that they utilize the Glasgow Coma Scale. Okay? Potential signs of concussion. This is something you can use on the sideline. Okay? Just background information that we gather demographically on everybody. And the scoring system, utilizing uh, many different components. Okay? Any questions so far? The child SCAT 3 is, remember, that's 5 to 12 years. This is where it's been validated, okay? And you'll note that the sideline assessment is, is geared towards kids. Where, where are we at now? Um, that's, uh, to me, uh, who speaks the Queen's English, you don't need the at in there. I don't know how it got in there. Where are we now is good grammar, okay? Um, ask him, is it before or after lunch? Simple things that kids in this age group can identify with. The symptom evaluation includes both the child's report and the parent's report. Because sometimes they need that liaison or the understanding uh, of the parent or the observation of the parent. Okay. The, constant, the digit span is a little different than in, in older athletes and the scoring is a little different. Okay. The balance examination is also a little different. Okay. So those are the things that have have really changed from the uh, previous uh, consensus statement. With this one, they looked at the cognitive dysfunction that is associated with uh, concussion, and it is re reasonable for a kid to miss a day or two of school. Okay? That's the recommendation because of the cognitive effect. Okay? As kids go back, you may, certainly as a physician, I may be asked to, say, give Johnny a little more time to do his assignment, uh, or to take a test, and it's really some um, flexibility on the behalf of the um, teacher uh, in communicating with the physician or other health care provider. Okay? Now certainly some kids may take advantage of it, uh, but I hope that's not the case. Okay? So here's the links that you can download them. They're printed off for you, and again, there is no charge with this. They are looking at um, funding for apps, so you can have these down on your, on your uh, smartphone. Um, and so that should be coming in the next 6 to 12 months. Okay? One of the things the consensus statement looked at was neuropsychological neuropsych testing. It is not mandatory. It may be a helpful tool, and we, I know that we uh, in the parish here are using the impact screening, and it has been a, a good tool. Okay? It is a piece of information. It is not what you base the return to participation on. It is a piece of information. So in my opinion, if, if their neuropsych testing is good and I'm examining and assessing the student, that's just a piece of information. Okay? If it's bad, it's a piece of information. If they're not at their baseline, it's a piece of information. Okay? Really, to get somebody who becomes a, a comp, uh, more challenging patient needs formal neuropsych testing. Unfortunately, we don't have access to that readily in our area. And this is, as I said, the baseline testing is not mandatory, but it, it may be useful. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. What about the management? Well, we look, we've always talked about physical rest. Now we're talking about cognitive rest, and it is relative rest. Okay. We have the, uh, that came out in 2004, the graduate return to uh, participation protocol, low ec level exercise. Uh, for the slow to recover, in other words, adapt it to the individuals. The key new thing is no same day return to play. If the diagnosis of concussion has been made by whomever, that athlete is removed from the practice or the game until further assessment. That is probably the biggest change in the consensus statement. Okay. As I mentioned before, neuropsych testing is a, is a helpful tool, but it's not the sole tool to. to to uh, um, assess that, okay? Hit the wrong button. Cognitive rest, as we mentioned, may take one to two days. Avoid mental stress, that means 
Johnny can't, or Jane can't go home and play video games because that's a stimulus and keep them away from computers, text messaging, they've also found to be um, stimulative and slowing recovery. So you really have to put them back into the times of the, when I grew up, like in the 60s, you know. You did what your parents did, told you and you uh, stayed away from all the bad things, okay? okay? So what is cognitive rest, okay? Short periods of reading is okay in school when you start to introduce it advance to a full day of school. It's just like that graduated return to participation from a physical standpoint, okay? Um, may need those adjustments. And the key thing is re return to learn before return to play, okay? So Johnny can't be out practicing if he's not at school full time. Okay? When do you make the judgment? There's no universally accepted guideline. It's a clinical decision. They should be asymptomatic for 24 to 48 hours. There's a graded exertion, and we'll, I'll bring that up shortly, okay? You progress if you're asymptomatic. If you're symptomatic, you hold and, and then wait till they're asymptomatic again, okay? What about equipment and gear changes? Do mouth guards reduce the incidence of concussion? No, they reduce the incidence of dental injury, okay? Uh, appropriate helmets are good. Rule changes. The spearing aspect in football, in hockey, they looked at body checking below the peewee level, um, and that's reduced the incidence of injury. So there's things that you can do within the context of the structure of the game as well as the equipment. Okay? And the other thing that you have to consider when you're returning them to uh, sport is uh, has this been a repetitive or, or a recent injuries? Because that makes it a little more challenging, okay? So there's a sample graduated return to play protocol. Lots are out there and they all fit, follow the same basic principles, okay? What about the, the athlete that is a little different, those symptoms that last more than 10 days? Is there some other diagnosis? Really the recommendations, the consensus statement is that you have a multidisciplinary team of physicians, trainers, neuropsychologists, people with expertise in sport-related concussion that can assess the athlete and make a, uh, an appropriate uh, management plan. Okay. What are some of the modifying factors we look at that, that may lead to uh, a more challenging patient? Um, listed here, the duration, the number, uh, prolonged loss of consciousness, as I mentioned earlier, greater than one minute, and we look at the age, comorbidities, if they've had a history of depression or ADD, it just makes it a little more complex, okay? So those are the things that we look at that, that are modifiable or may contribute, okay? What about adolescents and kids? Again, the SCAT-3 for children, typically longer recovery. We talked about return to uh, cognitive re rest, pardon me, and the important thing is return to learn before return to play and we are more conservative with our kids than we are with adults, okay? So that's probably the big message we have, okay? Summary, concussions are common. Fortunately, most of them are not serious, and most of them do not have long-term sequelae, okay? The Zurich Symposium, the consensus statement, has a new SCAT-3. Look for the red flags to help people. The important thing is no same-day return, and kids are different their brains are developing, they take longer to recover. Okay. So this is where you can access this information, and again, it's downloadable. Okay. Other sources um, are the American Academy of Neurology that has a consensus statement, or a, a statement out with guidelines, and the CDC does as well. As I said, these are people th that are um, groups that are dealing with people that are both sport-related and non-sport-related. So, any questions? Good. Um, I just have one other thing I'd like to do, and this is sort of complementary of um, what uh, Scott and, and the Republic Group is doing. And it's about something that we're going to introduce into the um, school system. FIFA is the International uh, Football Association known to us as soccer. And this is the 11 plus program. A number of years ago, they came out with a preventative program based on scientific evidence 
um, looking at injury reduction uh, in soccer and um, had some good studies. Oops. Okay. Um, and this information is based on um, information I received from um, Kathy Campbell, who is uh, the Canadian National Women's Soccer Coach or Physician, and from FIFA. So I'd like to acknowledge their contribution to it. Okay. So the prevention of, of football, and, and you'll note football instead of soccer. Okay. Um, they looked at the rules of the game, they look at fair play, so rule changes impact uh, injuries. Um, and uh, with headers, they looked at upper arm contact and elbows to the head, and then they've looked at these uh, exercise-based programs. The 11, and as I said, now this is called the 11 plus, okay? And again, my acknowledgement to them, okay? It's a complete warm-up program to prevent soccer injuries, okay? This reduces injuries, so hopefully, with the information that we can get through Scott and his group and, and Dr. Cassio, we've got a, a multiple pronged approach to reduce injuries. We all know it's easier to prevent an injury than it is to treat one. Okay? This applies to, to 14 years of old, older. It's two times a week. It takes about 20 minutes and can be incorporated into their warm up. Parts one and three are running. Part two is strength, plyometrics, and balance. And there are levels of progression. Prior to a match, you can use the two uh, running aspects, uh, parts one and three. Okay. Uh, pretty busy slide, but um, it looks at the running exercises, part one, that takes eight minutes. We are looking at strengths, plyometrics, and balance, that takes uh, approximately ten minutes. And the last two minutes is, is uh, just running again. And we look at a complete warm-up program. And this is a randomized controlled trial based on information uh, published in 2008. Okay. These are the results. They looked at almost 1,900 female soccer players in Norway, average age of about 15. Um, those in the 11 plus group versus the control, the incidence of all injuries was reduced by about one third. Um, pretty good investment in time, if you ask me. Uh, incidence and match, about the same. Okay. Severe injuries was reduced by almost 50% okay, by taking 20 minutes three times a week. Okay. Okay. So the bottom line, these are ri risk of injuries reduced, okay, severe injury by almost 50%. This has been used worldwide, um, very similar to the PEP program that was mentioned earlier, but uh, refined to a different degree. <coughs> So the incidence of injury, we know that more happen in matches than in training. It, it varies with the level of skill, so elite level players or uh, international level players are at a little different risk profile, and most injuries are contact injuries. Okay? Most of them affect the lower extremity. Ankle sprain is still the most common joint injury in soccer, and um, most injuries in, in competitions of female players were minor rather than major. ACL and head injuries are of special concern, and I think with the work of Dr. Casso and Scott and the Republic Group, uh, I think we're going to be able to help them. Okay? So these are prevention programs known to reduce risk factors and injuries. Okay? This is the website that you can pick it up on, um, the sport medicine uh, uh, trainers uh, from Memorial are going to uh, be able to incorporate this and work with coaches into their soccer programs and, uh, and we'll, we're going to follow these uh, young people. Um, the nice thing is, is FIFA is invested in this. There's discs, there's posters, they supply them free to you. So uh, we hope that this will have a, a positive uh, impact on uh, the injury patterns, at least in soccer players in our area. And uh, we hope that uh, keeps people out of Dr. Cassio's hands. Okay. <laughs> Any questions?